Somebody's using the word encoding instead of correlation again. Instead of correlation again. Somebody's using the word encoding. Pittsburgh and Universe, this is JC on a bike. My name is JC and this is Journal Club on a Bike. Well, somebody's using the word encoding instead of correlation again. And so we're going to cover a nature paper today and we're going to cover it a little bit more frictiony than we usually do. I covered Ann Churchland's recent offering a couple weeks ago where she showed that single trial variation in neuronal networks is largely explained by the movement of the animal and I argued that only her last figure was really interesting from the perspective of neuroscience because at least she tried to use her analysis methods to parse individual cells but still in the end she was parsing correlation and not causation. And in that paper they did no manipulations to demonstrate that their hypothetical quote unquote understanding of the signals that they recorded was valid. And I think this paper is largely the same thing. They state in their abstract that they record from 30,000 neurons in 42 different brain regions. And they see that movement and, and this kind of thing explain most of the variation in most of the brain regions and most of the brain regions are activated by motion. And so in figure one they show that they can record from a shit ton of neurons and from all kinds of different brain regions and they show that they can record from these neurons during a task. I mean, it's almost like it's a neuropixel proof of concept paper and that's it. Like, look how many neurons we can record from. And nowhere in the abstract do they state a hypothesis. Nowhere in the abstract do they use the typical previous studies have shown X, Y, and Z. And then here we show something else. There is literally none of that language in this paper and why? because none of that language applies to this paper. There isn't really a hypothesis. If there is a hypothesis, I'm afraid the hypothesis is that if we record from 30,000 neurons in 42 brain regions, we will find some correlation with particular behavioral landmarks that we as the experimenters identify. Now, in figure two, you can almost hear this same logic in their, in their figure title. The figure title is in and of itself or like a misnomer or mislabeling of the data. See if I can recall it directly. The title of the figure is Brain-wide recordings during a task that distinguishes vision, choice, and action. Well, this is kind of funny. Who distinguishes vision, choice, and action? You have chosen a task where the experimenter can easily delineate between choice and action and behavior or whatever. But, like, that's on you. That's on the experimental design. That's on the experimenter determine when those time points are so it's still just correlation it's correlation with what the experimenters deem relevant 
And the experimenters don't know what's relevant to coding in the brain. They simply don't, especially not for this task. If they did, they would state it in a hypothesis. So that's my problem here. Like you can't just, you can't just record from 30,000 neurons and say, look what we did and get a nature paper. It really shouldn't be like that. But right nowadays it is. And I don't understand it because I like Ken Harris. I think he's got a great lab. I think he's a really smart dude. But if your only hypothesis is that if you try to correlate neuronal firing with experimenter determined landmarks in a, let's say, well designed quote unquote experiment where these things can be delineated very easily by the experimenter, then yeah, you're going to find correlation. Surprise, surprise. And this tells you nothing about how the brain works. Absolutely nothing. Look at figure three. Figure three shows that visual cues activate the visual cortex before activating the rest of the brain. Uh oh, ha, that sounds like nature to me. Holy crap. Now we really understand the brain. And so I'm sorry I have to be so sarcastic, but I mean, is there really a figure in a nature paper in 2020 that states that visual cues go to the visual cortex before they go to the rest of the brain? Are we really there? Apparently we are. And so if they do correlation with choice, you know, they find it a little more difficult to do and they find less neurons are involved in it. But they find choice neurons in the forebrain and in the midbrain that fire very specifically during the making of the choice. But his choice neurons really a his choice neurons really is sufficient understanding for nature that they correlate with the time around the choice. Is that really a nature paper conclusion? I really don't think so. But we are doing that here. This is what we're doing right now. This is the nature paper that we're discussing. And the thing about it that bothers me maybe the most is that this isn't the first time they've produced a paper like this and the incremental changes between how they interpret their data from one paper to another are, are even very difficult to discern. You would think that if it's a single lab that their logical progression between papers would be obvious. Let's watch the Moser lab for a minute and see how the Moser papers build on one another. Let's look at any reasonable lab, and their papers tend to build on one another. I don't see how Ken Harris's lab's papers build on one another. They just keep putting out giant data sets, and they keep analyzing giant data sets, but they never once do a manipulation. Let's mess with the choice they're making and see if the choice neurons are affected. Don't you see? The moment he starts manipulating the experiment, he's not going to be able to explain the neuronal results, the, the neuronal patterns that he sees. And if he can't explain the neuronal patterns he sees, then there won't be a paper here. And so that, to me, is what's so awful about this. And I love neuroscience, and I'm really, really, really interested in how the brain works. But I just don't understand how this nature paper makes us any closer to that goal of understanding how the brain works. We're just not any closer. We're not anywhere, if anything, we just have more data we don't understand. He's given us a giant data set that we can't understand any better than a data set with 3,000 neurons. Except now there are more neurons to correlate to. That's it. So in a way, the statistics get worse, not better. That's what I mean. So that's pretty crazy. 
that that's where we're at. You know, where's the necessary and sufficient? Where's the causation? Where's your hypothesis? Where's the statement that we usually see in the, in the abstract that tells us succinctly what this finding is? And there isn't. And if you read the end of their discussion, you will also just hear vague terms about coding, encoding, encoding, encoding. These things are not encoding anything, and they haven't shown you that they're encoding anything. What they have shown you is that they correlate their firing to particular behavioral landmarks designated by the experimenter. They have not shown you that these neurons are encoding anything. The other people have. The people who have made recordings from visual cortex and then lesion visual cortex or recorded from visual cortex and then blocked or whatever, these people have also come closer to showing that the visual cortex is encoding visual information than Ken Harris's lab is with this paper. And I, again, I'm just frustrated because it's a nature paper. I'm frustrated because as a field, we seem to be slowly drifting away from hypothesis-driven neuroscience to this idea, and it's a very bad idea, that that big data and just analyzing big data after the experiment with no manipulation is somehow going to get us there. And the point that I really want to drive home is that this is a bullshit idea. And the papers that I'm going to suggest that you read are twofold in order to overcome this idea. The first paper is by Romain Brett in Brain and Behavior. It has two rebuttals to it as well. And the rebuttals are well written, but basically he asks, is neural coding a apt metaphor for the brain or not? And his conclusion, of course, given my recent pitch, his conclusion is it's definitely not. It's, it's not a good metaphor for how the brain works. There are not going to be very many, if any, neurons that code for things or items or variables that we can decode in a linear fashion. There's just not going to be. It's not going to happen. So the Bayesian brain is also kind of a bullshit idea that neurons are encoding probability. That means that somewhere in the brain then there's a, a decoder that decides which probability is the highest and then goes. So that's also baloney. And if that's what you believe, then look for those things. Show me the encoder, show me the decoder. Show me how probability is encoded in the brain, but don't look for that in your grant application, and then when your paper doesn't find it, don't tell us. And you gotta presume that if he had better information, he would. So the second paper, besides the Brett paper, which I think is amazing, just for a coffee table read, is a paper by Jonas and courting, where they ask the question, could a neuroscientist understand a microprocessor? And what they do is they do neuroscience experiments on a microchip and contrast how these tools work on a microchip to how they're applied to neuroscience. And the paper is just spectacular. They make, in figure one, they explain to you that all the connectivity is known. All the input-output rules are known. So we can evaluate how close we get to understanding the microchip using these tools. And so they make a connectome. They look at functional circuits try to identify parts of the microchip that work together during different tasks. They do lesions of different transistors to show that some transistors are required for games and others aren't. So they call those Donkey Kong or game transistors.
and it goes on and on. They use all of the things that are used in modern neuroscience. Excuse me. He does tuning curves. He looks at field potentials. Uh, I mean, there's 12 figures in this paper that are all replicating some pretty standard neuroscience experiment where we're exploring the microchip. And after all those patterns are discerned and after all those relationships are quantified, you come to find out that we don't understand anything about how the microchip works after all that work. Now, of course, this is a little bit staged and a little bit bullshitty. The brain is much more complicated than a microchip, but that's the point. We know everything there is to know about a microchip because we built it. And yet, by employing the techniques that we use in neuroscience on the brain to a microchip, we are not able to penetrate its functionality. Penetrating its functionality is full of false positives. None of which contribute to your understanding of the fiend as a whole. And so then the argument is, is that, look, these are not valid ways to explore the brain. Having a connectome is not going to do it. It's probably part of the problem or part of the solution, but it's not good enough alone. And a connectome with, with correlation is definitely bullshit, what they show here. And so, if you like Ken Harris's work and you like Ken Churchland's work and you like the work by these labs where they're doing these, gathering these giant data sets, I think it's important to take it with a grain of salt. And those two references that I'm including here, computational references, I think are really important to read. Oh God, because you got to get out of this mindset and save yourself from the mindset of pretending that this is neuroscience. It's neurobiology. They're not doing neuroscience. Neurobiology is when you make observations and that's what they're doing. Making observations about who's connected to who. And in this case, in our paper, we're talking about who fires with who and during what time periods relative to some stereotype behavior that they call a task. But even with the stereotyped behavior and even with an entire brain recording, the best they can do is title figure three visual information shows up earlier in vision, visual cortex, than in the rest of the brain, which is a hilarious title for a figure. Okay, so thanks for joining me on my ride. That was a big shout out to Kenneth Harris Lab at UCL. Um, they are known for their neuropixel recordings. In this paper, they do 30,000 neurons in 42 different brain regions, and they show that they can find correlation between neuronal firing and a number of different time points and, and, and landmarks during the task that they uh, put the animal through. Um, I'm a little frustrated with this paper and papers like it simply because they don't put forth a testable hypothesis and it seems to be just a methodological uh, joggernaut in the sense of, wow, look at how many neurons we, we can record from and we have all this data, but then to find patterns in this data isn't really meaningful. And I gave you two other papers to look at to help you think about this problem and this concept, one of them by a Romain Brett in France 
in brain and behavior and one in uh, I'm not sure what journal it's in but it's uh, Jonas and Cording's paper from 2017 where they look at how neuroscientific techniques applied to a microprocessor can't really cut it in terms of delineating the function of particular parts of the of the microprocessor and so in a lot of ways because we don't know as much about the brain as we do about a microprocessor it becomes an even more challenging thing if we don't know how to divide the brain we don't know what how output changes relative to input we know all of those things for every component of a microprocessor and yet by using neuroscientific techniques we can't get any closer to understanding their functional relationship so how if applying these techniques to a brain where we don't know the relationship between the parts and we don't know the functional equations that describe their relationships then how will correlation get us anywhere to understand what meaningful patterns are versus what random patterns are and I think that's where we are in the state of neuroscience right now where there is a whole sect of neuroscience getting high impact high profile papers by producing big data without producing big understanding and I think if you look at the papers that come out of these labs what you're going to find is they don't really build on one another if you look at the Moser lab papers for example each paper tends to build on the one that came before it exploring a new aspect of the coding regime that they purport to assign to the cells that they study here when they assign a coding regime they don't even do a manipulation to test whether or not their coding regime that they've assigned to it is valid and that I think is where nature is starting to miss the boat here because we're not anymore talking about causality we're not talking anymore about necessary and sufficient we're just talking about look what we did and if it's big enough and you use enough statistics to analyze it and make enough graphs apparently it's good for a nature paper but I don't agree with this paper being in nature I think it's a valid giant data set I think the observations are valid I think the analysis is valid but in the end Kenneth Harris doesn't know any more about how the brain works before they did this analysis than after and they haven't demonstrated to us that they understand because they've done no manipulation if you like to like and subscribe I'm not always going to be this harsh but I'm trying to push the field forward I'm trying to stimulate discussion and if you have anything to discuss please put it in the comments or DM me or uh, email me get a hold of me on Twitter however you want to do it uh, I'm really enjoying this thanks for the feedback and I'll see you next time